Hello everybody and welcome to part two of this Flask blog tutorial series. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how we can do all of the security and authentication for our application. So how to sign users in, sign them out, create new accounts, all of that fun stuff. Now in the previous video, we created our sign up and login page. So what I'm going to start by showing us how to do here is actually get the information from these forms. So from, you know, the login and from the sign up. Then, of course, we're going to need to actually create users, store them in some sort of database. We're going to have to hash their password. We're then going to have to validate things like if their username or email is already taken when they try to sign up and create an account. This will take a good amount of time. But once this is done, this is a lot of the, the tough and difficult stuff finished. Then we just need to go and actually build the blog functionality of the app. So let's go ahead and get started. So I want to start by just showing you what happens now. If I fill something in, so maybe go Tim at Gmail. Oops, I don't want that in all capitals. Tim at gmail.com. Maybe the username is Tim and the password can be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so when I press sign up right now, notice we get method not allowed. Now the reason we get method not allowed is because if we go to our sign up page here, we have a form and this method is post. This means when we press this button right here, we're going to take all of this form data and we're going to submit this in a post request to the slash sign up URL. Now, right now, if we go to auth.py, we have not explicitly defined that we are allowed to send a post request to this URL. So by default, the only method that is allowed HTTP method, I'm going to describe what this is in a second for all of our routes is a get request. So the most basic and most common HTTP request is a get request. What that means is you are asking for information from the server. So get means get, give me something, right? You're asking for something. And in most cases, what a get request is, is you're asking for the HTML of the web page to actually make it up, right? So when I just go here and I, I hit enter and I go to sign up, I just sent a get request to my server asking for the HTML that makes up the sign up page. And you can see that if you go to the uh, Flask app that's running, it says get sign up. And notice we had post sign up and then we had 405, which stands for method not allowed. So these are status codes. 200 stands for OK. 405 stands for method not allowed. And method was not allowed on sign up because we have not explicitly defined it can accept a post request. There's a few other requests as well. We have a put request, a delete request, update request. There's a bunch of other ones. I won't go through all of them, but just understand that the different types of requests are used for different things. Theoretically, you can return anything from any type of request. But post is usually the type of request you use when you are creating something or sending data to the server. Now, there's sometimes some exceptions, but a lot of times when you are creating something new in the database, so like creating a new user, you're going to send a post request to our URL. That URL will listen for that post request, and then it will look for all of the data related to what it's going to be creating in the database. So anyways, the whole point of this is to say we need to go into our auth.root here. Let me make this full screen and I need to say method is equal to sorry methods is equal to and then a list and inside of here I'm going to say get and post. So this is saying, OK, the methods that are allowed for this URL are get and post by default. It's just get. OK, so I'm going to take this and I'm going to put this on login as well. Uh, and for logout, that's fine. We can just leave that as a, uh, a get request. OK, so now if I go back here. And I refresh and I press sign up. I don't get an error, right? So it is actually sending a post request. If I go here, we can see we're getting a bunch of post requests sent to this URL and it's refreshing the page after the post request comes in. Nice. So now how do I actually get the data that's being sent from the form? Well, we need to import something from Flask. This is called request. So this is a variable that will store all of the context related to a specific request. So you use this everywhere inside of all of these functions, you use the same request variable. And the way that you actually get data that's inside of a form is you do the following: you say data is equal to request dot form, then dot get and the name of the item in the form that you want the data from. So in this case, if I go to sign up, notice how I said we have to have these names here, right? Email, username, password one, password two. So the way I access these pieces of information is I say request.form.get and then I put in the name of what I'm looking for. So in this case, I want the username, right? So we could say rather than data, just username. And just very simply here, I'll start by printing out the username 
just to see if this works. Now, the reason you do dot get is because if this does not exist, if username does not exist, this will return none. So rather than crashing your program, which happens sometimes if you did this in a different way, it will simply return none to you. So the username will be equal to none if there is a no username field that's sent to the post request. OK, so let's go here and let's refresh. Uh, oops, actually, let me just hit enter. Now let's enter username. Let's enter Tim. Let's press sign up. Notice here it prints out Tim because it's printing the username. So now let's do this, this line right here for all of the different things that we want. So we want the email. We want the oops, the password one. Uh, what am I doing here? OK, and then we want the password two. So let's fix that. OK, and password two. Nice. Now, obviously, we need to change these. So this is going to say email. This will say password one not password backtick and then password two. Nice. OK, so we have just sent all of this data uh, or we've just received all this data now inside of sign up. Now we can do the same thing inside of login, but inside of login, all we're going to need is the email and the password. So let's just put this in here while we're at it. So we'll say email and then rather than password one, this just give me password like that. Nice. There we go. So now we're actually getting all of this data from these different uh, these URLs or these endpoints or the back end, whatever you want to call. It. OK, that's great, but we can't actually do anything with this data yet until we create a database and have some place to store it or to check if it is valid. So that's what we're going to do now. So I'm going to go to init.py. I'm going to start setting up my database. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but it's not crazy. What I'm going to do is create a variable. I'm going to say db is equal to and this is going to be SQL alchemy like that. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I need to do. Next, in all capitals, I'm going to say db underscore name is equal to database dot db. So I'm just defining the name of my database. And then what I'm going to do is configure my database inside of my create app function. So I'm going to say app dot config. And I'm going to say SQL underscore alchemy. Uh, am I ever spelling that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not SCL, SQL alchemy underscore database underscore URI. This is an I, not an L. Make sure that's an I. Then you're going to say equals, and we are going to put the path to our database. Now, for this application, we're going to use an SQLite 3 database. You don't need to know what that means. It's just one of the simplest ones to use, and we don't need to write any uh, like actual SQL or SQL. We can literally just use the built-in Flask SQL related commands to, you know, query our database and find users and add stuff to it. It's pretty straightforward. But here what we need to do is make an F string. So I'm going to say F and then I'm going to say this is SQLite colon. This is going to be two slashes, I think. Sorry, actually three slashes. And then we're going to say DB underscore name like that. There you go. Now what we're going to do after this is say DB dot underscore or sorry, init underscore app. And we are going to pass our app, which is our Flask application. So if you want to know exactly why you need to do all of this, you can reference the SQL Alchemy documentation. But essentially, we just need to tell Flask where our database actually is. And then we initialize our database with our Flask application. Nice. Now, there's a few more things that we need to do. The next thing we need to do is actually create the database. So what I'm going to do is make a function here and call this create database. This is going to take an app. And what this is going to do is check if the database already exists. If it doesn't, it's going to create it. So it's going to say, if not, then it's going to be path dot exists like this. And we're going to say website slash plus db underscore name. OK. And then here we're going to say db, oops, db dot create underscore all app equals app. And then I'm just going to print out created database exclamation point. OK, so let me just explain what this is doing. So path dot exists pretty straightforward. We're checking if this path exists. So if website, which is the name of our folder here, slash DB name exists. If it doesn't exist, then we're going to create it. So we'll say DB dot create all. We pass the app to this and it will actually make the database file for us. And then we print create a database. This is not what you would normally do in production. But since we're just creating like, you know, a local application, uh, this isn't going to be the next Facebook or something. This is totally fine. We can just do this. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go here and we're going to call our create database. Now, it doesn't really matter where you call it, at least right now. It will in one second. And we need to pass this, sorry, the app. OK, 
Now I need to just look at my cheat sheet here to see what else I need to do. Okay, so let me just move this. I just want to keep things a bit organized. So let's put that right there. Okay, so now we are creating our database. However, right now the database is completely empty. And that is because we haven't yet created any models or tables in our database. So what we're going to do is make a new file inside a website. We're going to call this models.py. All right, so I'm inside of models.py. As I was saying, this is where we're going to define all of our database models. Before we do that, though, I need to import a few things. So I'm going to say from dot import db dot stands for the current package that we're in. So from website import db, which really means from this init.py file, import this db variable right here. So we're importing that, standing for database, obviously. And then we're going to say from, this is going to be flask underscore login import user mix in like that. Then we're going to say from, and this is going to be SQL underscore alchemy dot SQL import funk. Now I'll tell you why we need that in a second. Let me spell alchemy correctly though. And now what I'm going to do is define my first database model, which is going to be a user. So what we're going to focus on right now is the user model, the user database table. So I'm going to code it, code out a little bit of it. Then I'll stop and explain exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to say class user. This needs to inherit from db.model and from the user mixin. So db.model is kind of a base class, which is a database model. Now, if any of you are familiar with relational databases, you you might not have heard of model before. You may have heard of table. So really, a model is just a table. It's like the model of a table, if that makes any sense. Now, a table has rows and columns. Every row in the table is a new user. Every column is information related to each user. So what we need to do right now is define all of the columns that are going to be in our user table. Then every single time we add a user, we fill in a new row of columns, and that is a user. That's as straightforward as it is. The reason we need this user mix in thing is because we're going to be using this plugin Flask login, which allows us to way more easily log users in and out. And so you just need to have your main user class inherit from this so that you can log users in and out. That's pretty much the best explanation I can give you. OK, so what information do we want for all of our users? Well, the first thing we need is, is an ID. So we're going to say ID is equal to DB dot column. And then we need to define the type of this column. What data is being stored in this column? Well, this is simply going to be an integer. So DB dot integer. And then what we need to do after this is state that this is a primary key. So primary key is equal to true. So let me explain what this is. On every single database model or every single database table, you need to have one column, which is the primary key. This is the key that is unique and that you will use to look up uh, users in this case or rows in, uh, if you're talking more generally in a database table. So every table needs at least one primary key. I think you can have multiple primary keys and like combine them together. But regardless, you need one. And that is almost always an integer. And in this case, we're calling it ID. You always need an ID on all of your tables. So we have our ID. All right. Now, this ID will actually automatically be created for us when we make new users. So we don't need to try to figure out what the last user was that we inserted, what its ID was. It just automatically gives it a unique ID. OK, next. What do we need? Well, now this is up to us. We have the ID. We've kind of filled in the mandatory stuff. What information do we want related to user? Well, we're going to need a username. We're going to need an email. We're going to need a password. And we probably want to know when this user was created. So like time of creation. Let me look and see if there's anything else. Um, actually, I think that's probably all we need for right now. So I'm going to say email is equal to db.column. And this column is going to be db.string. And it's going to have a maximum length of 150 characters. So when you don't do db.string, you need to define a max length for this string. We'll say the email has a maximum length of 150. All right. Then after this, we are going to define that this must be unique. So unique equals true. This makes make sure that we cannot have any users that have duplicate emails. OK, we have our email. Next, we need our username. So this will be the exact same thing. We'll literally just leave it exactly like this. Unique equals true. Uh, and finally, we'll say password is equal to. And then this will be same thing, except the password does not need to be unique. So we'll remove unique equals true. OK, so that's actually all we need for the user right now. Sorry, we're going to do date created as well. So let's do that. Date created is equal to. And then I'm trying to remember what this will be. DB dot column DB dot date time zone is equal to true. And let me see if there's anything else we need there. 
uh, we're going to add a default value. So the default is going to be func dot now. Okay, that's why I needed to import func. So let me just explain what this line just did here. So say, okay, we're going to have a column. This is going to store a date. We want to know the time zone associated with this date. When you say date, it also it stores the time as well. It's date and time, but we also want the time zone. Uh, and then the default means, okay, if we don't pass something in here, what should by default we fill this with? Well, we're going to call func dot now. What that will do is uh, that will fill this by default with whatever the current time is. So it's kind of weird why this is called func, but that's why I imported this. This just gives you the current time. So we're going to make that the default. Now, let me just look at something here. Uh, OK, I just want to make sure everything's good. It looks good to me. All right. So we've now created our user model. Now we're going to go back to init.py and we're going to import the user module on line 22 or user uh, model, sorry, on line 22. So we're going to say from dot models import user. The reason we need to do this is if we don't import the user, when we go to create the database, it won't create the user table. So before we create our database, we need to import all of the models individually that we want to be created in our database. So that's why we're doing that. We're importing this, making sure this is a part of our Flask application. Now we've imported it in and then we create the database. So we make the user table. Nice. Now, before we do that, or actually maybe after we do that, we'll see. I'm just going to look at my file here. Yeah, we can do it after we do that. We're going to set up what's known as our login manager. So here I imported login manager in the previous video, but we haven't yet used it. So we create our database, but now we're going to set up the login manager. So we're going to say login underscore manager is equal to login manager. Now, this is what's going to allow us to log users in and out of the website and make sure every time they come in, they don't have to type in their username and password, and they have access to certain pages if they're logged in, but they can't access certain pages if they're not logged in, right? So we're going to say login manager dot login underscore view is equal to auth dot view. So essentially what this means is, okay, if someone tries to access a page and they are not logged in, where should we redirect them? We should redirect them to auth dot, sorry, login. That should not be view. It should be auth dot login. So that means we're going to go auth and we're going to redirect them to this login page right here. Pretty straightforward. All right. And then after that, we're going to say login manager dot and then init underscore app. And we're going to pass our app. Nice. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to create a function so that our login manager can actually find our user model when it logs something in. Seems a little bit strange. I'll just code it out and I'll describe what it's doing. So login manager dot user underscore loader. OK, this is a decorator we need to put here. We're going to say define load underscore user. It's going to take an ID and I'm just going to type something out. It's going to seem a little bit confusing. I'll describe it in a second. So user dot query dot filter underscore by ID equals ID. OK, and we're going to actually return this. And sorry, this is just going to be user dot query dot get. I did this wrong int ID. All right. So what did I just code out here? So what I just coded out is something that allows me to access information related to the user from my database, given the ID of a user. So login manager, my understanding, I'm not super familiar with this, by the way, but my understanding of it is it uses a session, which I will describe in a second to store the ID of a user that is logged in. So if you are logged in, like you on your computer, go to this website and you're logged in, there will be some uh, data stored in your session, which is the ID of your user. Now, whenever you want to actually access, say, the username or the email or the password of that user, you use that ID to do so. And so we're defining how we're going to actually access the user given the ID. So what this is doing is saying we have this user model. We're going to query it, which means try to find something from it. And we're going to get the user object that has an ID equal to the ID that was passed here. And the reason why we have this is because the ID will be stored as a string. We need to convert it to an int because the column we have here for ID is an integer and it must be an integer. There you go. That's pretty much all it's doing. If this is super confusing, don't worry about it. Just type it in and it will work for you. OK, what is a session? So it's a little bit difficult to describe. But whenever you go to a website, your computer has a session with that website. Now, 
that website will store like some unique identifier about you visiting the website and then it can have some information stored in your session. So maybe the last page that you were on, maybe if you're logged in or not, maybe uh, like what you typed in for your password last time, so random stuff. You can store stuff in session. That's why when you go to Facebook, for example, you don't have to sign in every single time or maybe it brings you back to where you were previously or if you were like in the middle of doing something and then you close the web page and you go back and it's still there, it's because it was stored in the session. Now, session is temporary, but you can choose how long it lasts. So I think by default here, the session lasts for 30 days, but you can choose how long session data will last. You can make it infinite, but sometimes you can like mess up a session. It's kind of hard to describe, but don't treat a session as a database. Just think of a session as kind of a temporary storage to store information about your client, your computer visiting a website so that you don't have to constantly log in, sign out, sign in, whatever. But what that means here is that login manager uses a session to determine if you are logged in or not. So when you return to your computer another day and you go back to this website, it checks your session and it says, OK, are you logged in? Yeah, you are. So let's bring you to this page rather than telling you you need to log in again. Hopefully that was a decent enough expl explanation of what's going on here. Then that's our login manager. And now that I'm looking at this, I think that's all we need to do inside of init.py. We might come back to it in a minute, but for now, that is fine. OK. So now that we have that, what I want to do is just run this app and see if this is working. So let's run this Python app.py. Uh, no module named flat or uh, SQL alchemy. OK, I know what's wrong here. Let's go to models. This needs to be flask underscore SQL alchemy. That would be why. OK, so let's try this now. Run and no module named flask SQL alchemy. Hmm, Am I spelling this wrong? All right, guys, one sec. Let me see if I can fix this error. All right, so I found the error. It's actually just SQL Alchemy, no flask. This is different than the one we used previously. So just remove the flask and you should be good. So let's try this. And uh, oops, date takes no arguments. Hmm. OK, <laughs> let's see. What have I done wrong here? Date. Let me look in my cheat sheet. Um, That would be why this needs to be date time. OK, so make that date time and now we should be good. Let's try it. Fingers crossed. OK, we're all good. So now let's go back to our URL. Let's refresh this. OK, and everything is working. We're not going to see anything different because we haven't really implemented any new functionality. I just want to make sure the database was working. All right. Now, I also noticed that it did not create. Oh, no, it said create database. OK, perfect. So it did create the database for, database for us. We might not be seeing it. Let me refresh and see if it shows up. But if it said create a database, I trust that it created it, I guess just because we don't have anything in there right now. So we don't actually see the database file. OK, so that's all good. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to make it so that we create a user account when someone signs up. And then I will show you how we can like log into that user account and all of that kind of stuff. So we will continue in one second. We need to quickly thank the sponsor of this video and this series, which is Algo Expert. Algo Expert is the best platform to use when preparing for your software engineering coding interviews. They have 160 coding interview practice questions, a data structures crash course, mock interviews, and a ton of awesome features to help you land your dream job. Get started with Algo Expert today by clicking the link in the description and use the code Tech with Tim for a discount on the platform. All right, so let's go into our sign up function here and let's start handling the logic for when we want to create a new account. So the first thing we need to do is we need to determine if we're creating a new account or if we're just trying to get the HTML for the page, because there's two different methods here, right? We could be posting data or we could just be asking for the HTML. And if we're just asking for the HTML, clearly we're not trying to actually make a new user. We're also not going to have any form data. We're not going to have email, username, password, anything like that. And so we need to check what method we have here. So I'm going to say if request dot method is equal to and then here I'm going to say post. <clears throat> Excuse me. OK, so inside of here, we're going to do an indent. This is where we're going to handle creating a new user. However, if it's not the post method, we're just going to return the sign up HTML page. OK, so we get the email, username, password and password. The first thing we need to check here is if this user already exists. So how do we do that? Well, we need to look in our database and check if the user exists. So I'm going to go up to the top of my program here and I'm going to say from dot import db and I'm going to say from dot models import user. OK, so how do we look in our database to see if a user with this email exists? What we do is we say user 
dot query dot filter underscore by and then we say email like that is equal to email dot first okay and i'm just going to go here and say user underscore exists equals this and instead of user exists we'll go email exists okay so what this does is it looks in the user database running user dot query and we're filtering this database or this table by an email so we're looking for an email equal to the email that this person typed in in the sign up form and then we're getting the first result that occurs if there's any result it will just be the first result right because we only are going to have one entry in the database with this email if that email exists in the database hopefully that makes sense but there's never going to be two users that have the same email and so doing dot first here just guarantees us we get the only user that exists with this email if they exist so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to check if this here exists right if we actually got a result so i'm going to say if email exists and i think that's literally all i need to do so if the email exists that means that we cannot create account because well the email already exists so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say flash and what flash will do is actually flash flash a message on the screen sorry that says hey this email already exists now we're gonna have to implement some logic for this to work first we need to import flash from right here and we're just going to put kind of the message we want to appear. So we're going to say email is already in use. And then we're going to say the category. So the type of this message is equal to error. So we can flash all kinds of different messages. We can flash uh, error messages, warning messages, uh, like success messages, like you posted something successfully. Again, we have to implement the logic for that. But for now, we're just going to do flash and I'll show you how this works in a minute. Okay, so if the email exists, or sorry, if the email doesn't exist, we want to check if the username exists. So what I'm going to do here is say username underscore exists is equal to user dot query dot filter underscore by. And I'm going to say username is equal to username dot first. Now we're going to do an elif here and we're going to check the exact same thing. We're going to say elif username exists. Then we'll flash username is already in use and then category is equal to error nice now let me just do some spacing here okay now what do we need to check next well we need to check the password first so if the email doesn't exist the username doesn't exist sorry we need to make sure the password is of correct length so it's at least x characters and both of the passwords mass match sorry so we're going to say l if password one does not equal password two, then flash passwords don't match. Oops, and this is be escape character don't match. Nice. And then we will say category is equal to error. Uh, I spelled it correctly. Yes, I did. Okay. So if the passwords don't match, we flash that. And then lastly, we want to check. I guess the length of the username and the length of the password. So we're going to say if the len of the username is less than two, then we will just flash something and say, hey, that's no good. You know, your username is too short. Username is too short. OK. Category equals error. And I suppose we could just copy this because we'll do this a few more times. Now we're going to do the same thing as password. So if the passwords match, then we'll check password one and we'll make sure it is at least six characters long so we're going to check if it's less than six if it is we'll say password is too short and then lastly we could verify the email i guess um but i don't really want to write any regex or anything to verify the email so we're just going to assume that the user types in a valid email you could check the email if you want you could send them like you know a, a, an email to verify that they actually who are who they are we're not going to do that in this we're just going to kind of say your email is your login information we won't validate it they just they can type whatever email they want although they do need to have an email that has at least let's say 10 characters in or something so we can do that we'll say l if the len of email is greater than we can pick whatever we want i'll go with 10 or sorry l if len of email is less than 10 then flash email is invalid and we'll go category equals error and now that i think of it that might be a little bit too short for the email i'm thinking of emails i've seen that are like four or five characters so you need an at symbol you need a period and then you're going to need another period probably hmm 
you, need, you just need an at symbol and a period, and then you need two characters at minimum. So let's just go. It has to be at least four characters. Okay, email is invalid. All right, and then finally, if all of this is good, we're going to actually create a account, right? So if none of this happened, if we didn't have any error messages, then we'll create an account. So we're going to say new underscore user is equal to, and the way we do this is we just use the class to make a new user. So we're going to say user. We don't need to pass the ID because that will be automatically generated. What we do need to pass though is the email username and password. So we're going to say email is equal to email. Username is equal to username and password is equal to password one. You could do password two. It doesn't matter because they're going to be the same. And then uh, there will be a date time that this user was created, but that will be automatically added as well. We don't need to add that. Okay, so now that we've created the user, what we need to do is actually add this to the database. So we've made the user, but it's not yet in the database. The way you add it to the database is the following. You go db.session.add, and then you add the variable that stores your user objects. So we're going to add new user. And then once it's added to the session, we need to commit it. So we're going to say db.session.commit. This actually writes it into the database for us. So this adds it to kind of the staging area ready to be put in the database. This puts it into the database. So there you go. Now we have created the new user. Then what we can do is flash user created. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And then we're actually going to return a redirect for the URL underscore four. And this is going to be views dot home. Nice. So let me just save this. And now we are good to go. So if we get through all this, we make the user, we add it to the session, we commit it, we flash user created, we redirect to the home page. Now, if any of these are not the case, we flash this message and then we would just actually return the template again. They'll have to type in their information again and then uh, they can try to create an account again. OK, so that is good. Although one last thing we need to do is we need to actually log in our user once they have created an account. So we could tell them to sign in once they've made the account, but I would prefer to just sign them in once they actually create the account. So the way we do that is we need to go here and say from uh, Flask underscore login import. And then I believe this is login. I got to go look at it here. Uh, login underscore user. There we go. And while we're here, we'll go uh, log out underscore user. And then this is going to be login underscore required. OK, so we're going to use these in a second. Now, I'm actually remembering that we can't do exactly what I just did here. So notice how I just stored this password right in this user model. I have not hashed the password. And so that means I'm actually storing the password in plain text. Now, that's bad. You don't want to store a password in plain text. So what we're going to have to do is hash it. I'll explain what that is in a second, but we need to import a module that can hash the password. So we're going to say from uh, Weserberg. How do you how do you say this? Workberg. I always mess this name up. Work zig like that dot and then security. We're going to import the following. This is going to be generate underscore password underscore hash. And then I need to look at my cheat sheet. This is going to be check password hash check underscore password underscore hash. Now I'm almost certain I spelt this wrong. Let's check this work zug dot security. OK, that should be good. You guys should have this module. You shouldn't need to install it. I believe it comes with Flask login or just with Flask by default. OK, so we have two methods here, generate password hash and check password hash. All right, so what is a hash and what is a hash function? I'm going to try to explain this to you because it's, it's pretty interesting. So essentially, the way that modern day security works is when you have a password, you take that password and you never store it in plain text. That means you need to store it in some other format, but you need some way to determine if the user's password is whatever you're storing, right? Is whatever the hash of that password is. So what you want to do is you want to take some password, you want to kind of encrypt it and store it in something that's not the password, but you need some way to go from that password to the thing that's stored so you can verify if the password is correct. But you never want to store the plain text password. This is where a hash function comes in. So a hash function is essentially a function where you cannot compute the inverse or there is no known inverse for this function. Now, what is an inverse? Well, with most functions, you have some x, so you give some x to it and it gives you some y. 
But if you have the Y, you can figure out what X is. So for example, if I have some function, I can literally do this in Python. I can just define this in Python. Let's say define foo. I take X and then what this does is it returns X plus two. If we were going to write this function out in math terms, this would be Y is equal to X plus two. Now, the inverse of this function you write in terms of X. So you would say, OK, well, if I know what Y is, can I figure out what X is? Yes, you can. X is equal to Y minus two. Right. This is pretty straightforward. You learn this in elementary school math. At least I'm pretty sure. But regardless, given uh, given Y, I can figure out what X is. I just subtract two from Y and that tells me what X is. So that's fine for regular functions. But with a hash function, there is no way to do that. That means given some X, you're always going to get the same Y. But given some Y, you have no idea how to get back to X. And so what we do here is we utilize the hash function to store a password. So I say X goes to hash function. Hash function goes to a hash. But from hash trying to get to X, that's impossible. There's no way for me to get to X given this hash, at least not that we know of um, that. It's kind of an interesting thing. Quick little shortcut here. If you guys are watching an hour long video, you probably don't mind a quick 50 and 20 second pause to explain something. Currently, our modern day encryption, we assume that there is no way to go from this hash back to X, that this is what's known as a one way function, one in which we cannot compute the inverse. But we actually cannot prove mathematically that there is no inverse. So there may be an inverse. There may be a way to go from a hashed password to the original plain text password. We just don't know of it. So that's a little bit of a scary thought because our modern day encryption relies on an assumption that there is no inverse, but there could be an inverse. We just don't know how to find the inverse right now. Anyways, I thought that was interesting, so I figured I'd share that with you. But regardless, X goes to hash function goes to hash. Hash is always the same for X. Any X you pass, if it's the exact same, you always get the same hash. However, from the hash, you cannot get back to X. So when someone types in their password, what you do is you hash it and then that gives you the hash and then you compare this hash with the hash that you've stored. So I'm going to store the hashed password and then whenever someone types in their plain text password, I'm going to hash it. and I'm going to check if that's the same as my hashed password. That means these passwords do actually match. But if you type in a different password, you get a completely different hash. You will never have uh, like two passwords that correspond to the same hash. Hopefully that was a decent explanation, uh, but that is how password hashing works. So we're going to do that. So we're going to go here and rather than storing the password, we're going to hash it. So we're going to say generate password hash. So generate underscore password underscore hash. The password is going to be password one. And then we need to choose the method for hashing. So the method is going to be uh, and this is going to be SHA-256 like that. Now, you don't have to know what this means. This is just a basic encryption method SHA-256. OK, so that's what we're going to use. And I think for now that is good. Perfect. So we've now generated the password hash. We should be able to actually create a user account. Now, while we're here, let's just code out the logic for login and then we'll actually see if any of this works, because once we create the account, we'll try to log in. So same thing here for login. We need to check if the request dot method is a post request. So we're going to say if request dot method equals equals post. Then what we want to do here is a few basic checks. So we need to get the email and the password. So we're going to get that and we're going to check if a user with this email exists. So we're going to say user is equal to user dot query dot filter underscore by. And we're going to say email equals email dot first. OK, we're going to say if user. So if actually sorry, if not user, uh, actually, no, we will do if user we will say if user. So if this user actually does exist, then we want to check if the password they typed in is equal to the password that we're storing in our user model. So we just got the user. If the user exists, we're going to take this password, we're going to hash it, and we're going to check if it is the same as the hash password we're storing in the user model. So we're going to say if check password hash, we're going to say user dot password. So that is the hashed password that we're passing first. And then we're going to pass the password. Let me make sure that's all we need to do. Yes, it is. OK, perfect. So make sure you pass the hash password first and then the plain text password after that. So if this is correct, this means the user typed in the right password. So we're going to say flash logged in and then we're going to return a redirect URL underscore four. And then this is going to be views dot home. OK, and before we do that, though, we are going to log in 
our user. So we're going to say login underscore user. This is going to be a user. And we're going to say remember equals true. OK, so this is the uh, method that we brought in here. This will log in our user with the login manager. So then we're able to determine if the person session or if the person visiting the website is logged in or not, because this will be storing the fact that this person is signed in in the session and it will store what user this person is signed in as. Hopefully that makes sense. But that is what we need to do here. Now, otherwise, the password is incorrect, right? So if this is not the case, then the password is incorrect. So we're going to say flash password is incorrect. And for both of these, sorry, we want our category. So this one is actually going to be category equals success. And this one will be category equals error. Nice. And then we want another else here. So if the user doesn't exist, then we want to tell them that the user doesn't exist. So we're going to say flash uh, user or email does not exist. Perfect. Now, I believe that's all we actually need. Nice. Yeah, that is all we need for login. And now I'm just going to go back here to sign up and I'm going to log in my user after we create the account. So I'm going to say login underscore user, new underscore user, remember equals true. Nice. And while we're here, we can just do the logout because it's pretty easy and say logout underscore user. And we're going to say current underscore user. I'm going to show you how we get this in one second. OK, so let's actually sorry, I don't even need to do that. I can just do logout user. I'm just looking at my cheat sheet here. All right. So now we should have the sign up and login logic done. I'm just kind of scrolling through here to see if I've done anything incorrectly. And I want to import one more thing, which is current user. You just saw me type that from Flask login. So this is really cool. Flask login lets you access all of the information related to the currently logged in user from the current user variable. So now anywhere, once I've logged in, I can access this current user variable and get the username, password, email of the logged in user. And what I'm going to show you now is something called the login required decorator. So if you put this, uh, actually, I think you need to put it here. It might not matter. I think you can do it in any order, but I'm just going to put it here because that's where I have it in my cheat sheet. This login required decorator, this is what this is known as, it decorates the top of the function, is something that makes it so that you can only access this page if you have been logged in. So only if this function has been called for your current user session, are you able to actually access this route right here? That's what the login required uh, decorator does. The reason I'm doing that on logout is because you can't uh, like log out unless you're signed in, right? unless you've logged in. And so that's why you need the login required. OK, let's run this and let's see if any of this works. That was a lot of code without testing. So let's go here. And we will implement the message flashing in a minute. Right now, you're not going to see the message flashing because we haven't done that. And let's just try to create an account. So I'm going to make an account. Let's say Tim at gmail.com, username Tim, password 12345671234567. Uh, OK, and sign up. Now, when I do that, it redirects me to home, which means I successfully created the account. Now, the way to actually verify if the account was created is to go back to login and to try to log in. So I'm going to go Tim at gmail.com. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And notice that worked. It redirected me. Whereas if I try to log in with the wrong credentials, so Tim at gmail.com and one, two, three, it doesn't redirect me. Right? It keeps me on the login page because the account credentials were not correct. So that is how that works. Now, though, we want to actually see the error message, right? Because it's kind of hard to determine if this is working or not when we can't see these flashed messages that we have. This is a little bit of code. It's in the HTML file that we need to write. So let's go to our base.html. Now, the reason we're going to put this in base.html is because we want these messages flashing to work on any page. So we put this in our base template. So as I was saying, there's this thing in Flask called message flashing. Now, when you do flash and then you do the text and the category, that passes that information to any templates that are rendered. So what I can actually do here is I can write with, and I need to go look at my cheat sheet because I don't have this memorized. I'm going to say messages equal to get underscore flashed underscore messages like that. I'm going to say with underscore and then categories is equal to true. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, OK, with this variable messages equal to get 
flashed messages and I'm saying, yes, I would like to know the categories of all of these messages. I'm going to do the following. So I need to end this uh, with first. I think this is end with. Let me just see if that's how you do it. Yeah, end with. That's correct. OK, so inside of here, the first thing I'm going to check is if I have any messages. So this will be a list of messages. So I'm going to say percent percent if messages like that. And then I'm going to say percent percent and if. OK, so if messages, what I want to do is now have a four. So I'm going to say percent percent for message in messages because I can have multiple messages flashing on the screen. And I'm going to say end for. Just bear with me here. If you've never seen this before, it probably seems a little bit complicated, but this is the way that you do it. OK, so for message in messages, I actually realized, sorry, we need to do this first. So for category comma message in messages, this will give us the category and the actual text message for each of our messages. This is the proper way to do it. What we're going to do is we're going to show the message. So remember, if you want to access the variable, you do it in double uh, squiggly brackets like that. So for now, we'll just show the message, uh, but I will show you later how we can actually style this and make it look nice. But let's just see if this actually works for now. Oh, God, I hate that it does that. Um, OK, I'm going to save without formatting. Let's just refresh the page here and let's see if any message flashing actually works. Look at that user created login password is incorrect. Nice. OK, let me just refresh. Um, that was all of the messages that were not yet shown, just got shown on the screen. OK, so let's just try to log in let's say Tim at gmail.com, 1234, log in, password is incorrect. Nice, OK? Let's try this again, Tim at gmail, 123, email does not exist. So the message is actually working. It's showing up, right? So I just want to prove that to you. That's how that works. This is kind of the code used to get the messages. Now, though, we want our messages to look a little bit nicer. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use some bootstrap. So we're going to create a div. This is going to be a class equal to alert, and this is going to be alert hyphen danger and then alert hyphen dismissible like that. Let me make sure I spell this correctly. I don't think I did dismissible. And then this is going to be fade show like that. And the role is going to be alert. Again, I get all this from the bootstrap documentation. So now if I do this and I put my message inside of div, uh, again, I hate the formatting there. Um, you will actually see that this is going to show up in a nice little kind of like banner. Now, we're not quite done because there's some more code that I need to write here. Uh, we need to actually put a button. I'm just going to copy this button inside of this div because this is an alert that we can close. So we have this button type button class button close and it closes the alert. Um, yeah, I guess this is just called an alert. Anyways, that's what this is here. I think that's good. Sorry, I keep looking at my uh, other screen. There's a lot of code, so I have to make sure I'm getting this right. OK, perfect. So what this is going to do now is it's going to show us a red kind of little banner on the screen, which is like, you know, the uh, the error message, right? So let's save this and let's refresh now and let's just see what this looks like. So let's refresh and let's go log in. Email does not exist. Hmm, OK, is there a reason it's not showing me that in the correct color? Um, maybe I type something incorrectly. It should be showing that to me in red. Ah, it's because I didn't type danger properly. Okay, so alert danger. All right, save without formatting. And let's try now. Refresh, continue. There you go. Email does not exist. Okay, so let's continue. You saw that that was indeed working. Now, the only issue is that right now we're only showing the kind of like error message, right? I need to also show one that's green if we have a successful uh, message. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to put an if statement inside of our for statement. Now let's go back to this. OK, and let's put an if and we're going to check the category. So we're going to say if category is equal equal to and in this case it is going to be error, then we can do this. So we can go percent percent and if and then otherwise. So actually we'll just do an else here. So let's say if it's not error, so we'll say else, then we will just show the success message. So we'll do the exact same thing, except instead of danger, it's going to be success like that. So let's save without formatting. OK, hopefully that makes sense. But we're saying if it's an error, show the error message. Otherwise, show the success. OK, so let's refresh. Now we get our red message. Let's go here. Let's actually successfully sign in. So Tim at gmail.com. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
log in, logged in. And then we can close it by pressing the X. There you go. Sign up. Same thing. It should work for that as well, but I won't show that for right now. So actually, at this point in time, this is working. This is this is all good. Now, the last thing we need to do here is go to views.py and we need to add the at login required decorator to make it so we can't access the home page unless we're logged in. So we're going to go from flask underscore login import login underscore required and then current underscore user. And what we'll actually do is we'll say the name is equal to current user dot username so that we can like greet the user when they log in. OK, and then we'll put the at login required here and I'll show you that we won't be able to access this page unless we're logged in. So let's go here and refresh. Now, right now, I think we actually are logged in because we just logged in. Right. So if I go here, oh, it actually says, please log in to access this page. Um, damn. OK, how did I get that? I don't even know how I got that to work because I don't know if I put something there. I think that's like a default thing that comes from login manager, but it's telling me, OK, I got to log in if I want to access that page. So what I can do now is go Tim at gmail.com. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Log in and email does not exist. Hmm, why does email not exist? Uh, Tim at gmail.com. Did I type something wrong? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Log in. OK, let's just try to create a new account. I don't know what's going wrong here. OK, let's go Tim two at gmail dot com. Tim two. OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, sign up. User created and then I access the home page. So that was good. We are logged in. Now, if I go to log in and I go Tim two at gmail dot com. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Log in. Logged in. Nice. OK, so it all is working. All right, so I think with that, I'm going to end the video here. I don't think there's anything more I need to show you. I understand this maybe was a little bit confusing, but there's not really a much better way for me to go through all of this because it is a lot of code. Uh, with that said, in the next video, we'll actually start working on the blog part of this application. So creating a post, comments, likes, all of that. And well, I hope you guys have enjoyed the video up until this point or the series up until this point. If you guys did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in another YouTube video. Thank you.